Welcome back to the Photo Banter Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Gagne, and on today's podcast, I speak with photographer Wesley Verhoeven. Wesley has worked with clients such as Airbnb, National Geographic, Squarespace, and Wired Magazine, to name a few. In this interview, I speak to Wesley about his newly published book titled Notice, which was photographed during the pandemic in Vancouver, British Columbia. I also speak to Wesley about how he went from working in the music industry to pursuing a career in photography and what advice he has for photographers looking to shoot commercial work. I also speak to Wesley about one of his longest running projects titled One of Many, where he traveled the United States photographing hundreds of different creatives in various cities. Wesley has a real passion for photography and the creative community, so I was excited to hear about his journey with photography. So I hope you enjoy, and thanks so much for listening. And also, if you're interested in picking up a copy of uh, Wesley's new book, um, you can go to Wesley's Instagram, at Wesley, to click the link in his bio. Um, the pre-order ends in eight days. Uh, so definitely go check that, out, check that out if you're interested in picking up the book. I highly recommend it, and I'll put the link in the description. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for listening, and I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Well, Wesley Verhoeva, welcome to the podcast, man. Excited to talk to you. Uh, you got a brand new book is coming out. Um, I guess to start off, man, uh, how you been doing? Been a crazy last year and a half or so with the pandemic, everything, but how you been hanging in there? Yeah, man, I think it's been, uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. It was really, uh, it's really an honor to be on. And uh, yeah, it's been crazy, man. It's, but you know, for everybody. So I think um, most of, uh, of the listeners will be able to sympathize uh, and empathize with the fact that everything's different you know everything's been different and everything's changed and slowly uh, we're getting back to uh, some of the normal if you will and uh, and also i think we've learned a lot during this pandemic as far as like some of the things that were normal that probably should be better now yeah um so yeah i mean it's a big convo but yeah it's, it's been a wild year and a half for me with a lot of changes have you and, been in and- in Amsterdam, Amsterdam the whole time? No. So the first five months I was in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is uh, where, where the entirety of my book was shot. And uh, then mid-August came to Amsterdam. All right. Um, cool. But yeah, I, I wasn't supposed to be in Vancouver for five months either. But after a month, you know, pandemic happened. And that's the first big change for me. Like borders closed, pandemic happened. And New York City, where I would have usually gone back to, uh, was the worst place in the world for for COVID. So that didn't seem like a good idea. So <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. And looking at your work, it seems like you're always traveling. Like you do a lot of really interesting projects. Um, how's it been kind of being at one spot for like a while? Because I know myself, I'm itching to hit, get back on the road and start shooting some stuff as if it's been kind of a different workflow in terms of your approach to work and stuff. Yeah, I mean, the, the two years previous to getting stuck in Vancouver for the past for the past two and a half even years, it's been like a different city in, in a different country every three months for me. Yeah. So Tokyo, Mexico City, Berlin, Amsterdam, Buenos Aires and Vancouver was one of those cities. It was supposed to be two and a half months. But then, you know, what happened, what happened? That's fun, man. It, it, it seems exciting. Like I need I, myself. I kind of get stuck. I've been in the same spot forever, but that seems kind of like a fun lifestyle. That's kind of bouncing around and tr- trying out different cultures and places. Yeah. Where are you? I'm in right outside of Boston, Mass. All right. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, um, I guess like with the new book, it's called Notice. I guess how long you've been working on that and what was kind of your goal with the book? So the first um, five months when I was uh, of the pandemic, when I was stuck in Vancouver, that's when I shot it. So, um, you know, as you already said, I, I'm used to traveling a lot uh, all over the world. And, and my whole thing is uh, walking the streets of these cities and, and stopping people that I'm curious about and, and having a conversation with them and taking their portrait. Uh, and that was obviously not possible. So I was not only in Vancouver, a city that was completely new to me, I was in a suburban part of Vancouver. So there was there weren't really anyone any people walking around to begin with but especially not when everything went locked down and so all of a sudden all my like normal things like traveling talking to strangers on the street taking portraits uh, casting people for commercial campaigns on the street all that kind of stuff was just just not possible anymore and so i had to come up with like a new kind of like ritual a new practice for my photography to kind of stay sane if you will and um that became going on a daily photo walk every day. So every day, same, around the same time of day, 
I would go on a photo walk and it was just really a meditative experience for me. It was something to keep me grounded in, in like the craziness of what was going on. And there wasn't much of a plan aside from every day I will go on a photo walk. And then after like a number of weeks, I, I started I started just shooting differently. I started notice like slowing way down. I, I started uh, noticing very special little things that I would have usually run right past in my like previous version of photography. Uh, and, and I kind of dug in and I, and I did, I did it for 123 days in a row. And, uh, that, that amounts to about 800 plus miles of walking all in the same neighborhood, which That's is kind of wild. We're staying fit, man. We're staying fit, getting them steps and taking pictures. Oh, so many steps. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I ended up, um, uh, after a few months, I was like, oh, maybe this could be a zine. Like I, had, I didn't have any plans for this, but now it's becoming a body of work and maybe it could be a zine. And then a couple of months after that, I was like, well, shoot, I got 35,000 photos. I, maybe I have enough for a book. And so started digging in, started curating. And here we are. Now we have a book. That's exciting. So when you're kind of going on these photo walks, would you kind of like, pick a spot you wanted to go shoot at or is it more kind of an organic process and it's kind of kind of taking it where where it comes pretty much or did you kind of go like i'm gonna go to this location today and kind of wander around there well no there wasn't any option for that it was like the whole thing happened in inside of this small suburban neighborhood that i was Mm. stuck in because not only was i stuck in vancouver i was stuck in my neighborhood because it was i'm not i I don't drive yeah you know there's no public transportation to take during a pandemic so I was just stuck walking from my rental apartment around that neighborhood. So that was it. There was no ever, there's no plan aside from the fact that I wasn't leaving the neighborhood. Yeah. I like it. Um, and I guess like, w- what was the process like putting this book together? It, it, are you self publishing it, working with a publisher and what's kind of that like editing process of like, um, like calling all the work together? Well, the editing process, excuse me, was pretty uh, wild. Um, I, because I shot so many photos, like uh, almost 35,000. Um, and I didn't get to see about half of them until it was all over because I shot half on film, half on digital. Mm. Um, I, I had, I, I got to like look at the whole body of work and it was so overwhelming so that I, I was able to curate it down to about 3000 and then 500. And then at, when, once I got to 300, I was like, I, I don't even know what is good anymore because I've looked at these photos so many times and I'm so close to the work. And so what I did was I, uh, I set up uh, about 20 zooms with different photographer friends whose opinion I respect and also some non-photographers actually. And I did like a screen share. So I, I, I set up my Adobe bridge and I walked them through the pictures, which can go much faster than if like back before the pandemic, I wouldn't have really known about zoom. I would have just been like, Hey, here's a folder of 300 photos. Can you take a look at them and tell me what you think, which is really too much of an ask. That's a lot. Yeah. Right. But if I can do it, if I say like, Hey man, hop on a zoom with me one hour, that's it. I'm going to show you some pictures and I can see their face. Right. So I can see how they're responding and what they're responding to. And I can start things while we're doing that. And so through that process of doing that with 20 different folks, I um, got down to about 120 and uh, from there on, it was um, my my friend and, and the designer of the book, Dan Rubin, also a photographer. Yep. Uh, him and I kind of like made the final selection down to 83 um, from there. So that's kind of how it went. And to answer your question about publishing, Dan Rubin and I started the publishing imprint called New Style. And this is the first book on that imprint. Wow, that's exciting, man. Like, have you guys collaborated together before? Or is this kind of like the first project you guys decide to kind of collaborate on? This is the first official project that we've collaborated on, but we've been friends for a long time. And we were always talking about photo all the time and meeting up and stuff like that. So while it's the first official project that we're working on together, it's, it doesn't feel like it in a way. No, that's exciting. And in terms of like, like showing your work to like 20 other photographers and some non photographers, is that something you do a lot with your work just to get input from people? Or like, because that's something I struggle with, like, I do these portfolio reviews where you can go meet with editors and all this type of stuff. And everyone has a million different opinions. And it's hard to decide, like, what I should do with my work. But like, is, mm-hmm. is that something you do a lot of kind of this get people's input? This is actually the first time that I've done it that way. I mean, I've, I've 
I've taken my portfolio to editors whose whose work I respect, and and that's a different. That's not really a the same thing because I'm sh- I'm just showing them what I think my best stuff is, right? And I can get their feedback on it, but yeah. it's not the same as showing them a bunch of photos and asking them which one they respond to best. So it's kind of a different story. But no, I hadn't really done that before. To be honest, it it, it just required it for this body of work. And was there a between the photographers and non-photographers, was there a big difference on the input and photos that people liked in particular, or was there kind of like a similarity well, of what people like? I think liked? the non-photographers respond more organically, more naturally, because they're just responding, right? Whereas a photographer like us, we can, we'll see a photo and maybe sometimes it's hard for us to like respond purely to the photo because we immediately see a technical thing or whatever, right? And so that's why it was important for me to have some non-photographers in there. I wouldn't say there were like shocking differences, but I do know that I've always, whenever it was a non-photographer, I always felt more compelled to consider what they were saying even because they weren't looking for perfection. They were just looking for emotion, which is kind of the point of photography, I feel. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Because I think I, I always say this, like when you first get into photography, you're just in it for the pure like love of it and the snapping pictures you're not so much thinking about like the technical stuff as much and cameras and like who am i going to sell this photo to it's just the pure joy of taking pictures so yeah that is it is interesting perspective of people that aren't thinking about the technical stuff um and you mentioned you kind of shot some on film and digital what was kind of your approach to that like why do you kind of want to kind of bounce between two different formats i guess well, it wasn't really that thought out. None of this project really was all that thought out because I just started doing it as like something for me to keep mm-hmm. myself kind of sane and grounded. And so I always shoot film. And so I I walked, I always walk around with two cameras. So I always have one digital on me and one film camera on me. And so that just kind of is how it went. You know, no, it's, it's shot on, it's shot on a bunch of different uh, stocks as well, because I wasn't, see if I, if I would have thought about it beforehand, I would have probably thought, all right, this is a project that requires Tri-X or Pan-F or whatever. Uh, but in this case, I, I didn't think about it at all because it wasn't that kind of thing. And so I shot a variety of stocks, but that's actually really cool because because I didn't think I didn't overthink it, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like a collage. Um, yeah, what about film? Because I, I think it's really, I grew up shooting film for years and that's what I started with. And it's really interesting to see like the film, like, there's like a resurgence of people shooting film. Like I'm talking to editors, some magazines like really enjoy the photographers shooting film for assignments. Uh, w- what is it about film that kind of keeps you working with the film, I guess? Well, it, it's a little bit of a cliche answer, but I think what it's not so much the result, but the process of shooting film that is very enjoyable because um, it saves me a lot of time. Because if you shoot digital, oftentimes it's very easy to get like trigger happy, right? Mm-hmm. And if I'm shooting film, especially medium format film, which is what I generally shoot most of, I can't snap away. You know, it's like 10, 10 photos per roll and it's expensive, you know? Yeah, for real. And, yeah, so, so for me, my main, my main photography really is analog photography. And I, and I, I, I I'm not one of those people that's like, you know, analog or die or whatever it's not like a it's not like a philosophical thing for me i just really enjoy it but i also totally love shooting digital it just what whatever the job requires like sometimes you can't shoot something on film because it's too fast moving or many reasons right or or there's no budget for it that's also possible and so i shoot i love shooting both but yeah i think the i think what i love about analog photography is just that it slows you down, which is super uh, appropriate and important about this particular project notice, because like I said, my normal pre pandemic mode was like running around like a crazy person in big urban busy centers and like spotting things. And for this project, I had to go way slow because I only had so much distance to cover. And I, I was specifically looking for like those, I call it like the small, bits of beauty and the little wonders that I would usually just walk right past, you know? So the analog really, really helped me with that. No, that's awesome. What are kind of some of your favorite film cameras? I rarely get into gear, but people love it. People love talking about cameras. What are kind of some of your favorite film cameras, I guess? 
Well, I shot this project on uh, one, two, three different film cameras and one uh, one digital camera. But the film cameras are, are number one is Pentax 672, which is my like go to always camera, uh, medium format. On uh, on small format, I shot it on the Pentax LX, and and I also shot some of it on peel apart Polaroid. Oh, wow. uh, on a on a Polaroid 600 SE, or like some people call it the goose because 600 SE looks yeah. kind of like the word goose. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I shot some of it on that as well. Yeah, the camera market's crazy now. I was looking because I still have my Hasselblad, the 501 CM, and I mm. bought it like in high school, and I can literally sell it now for like either the same price or more that when I bought it back then, which is fucking crazy. It's just, yeah, uh, it is. I mean, there's a there's a finite supply, and it's getting more popular again. So some of these, especially the cameras that are hot on YouTube, yeah, you know, like the RZ or or the Pentax, or you know, like or all the contacts. It blows my mind. People spend like two grand on like a little like uh, point and shoot jam. They're great, right. but, but it's wild. Um, yeah, I think that's also because it's they're being bought bought by non photographers, right? Like no, no non photographer is picking up a Mia RZ. Right. Yeah. That's like only for photographers, but the, the contacts it's point and shoot, you know, it's simple. And they see that Kendall Jenner has it and uh, Frank Ocean has it. And so, you know, young people that are, are like, Ooh, photography, the analog, that's cool. That, that's the camera that they see on, on social media or whatever. So that's why they get, you know, they're so expensive. It becomes like a Rolex. It's like a fashion. Basically. Item yeah. yeah. <laughs> a Rolex that can break. Yeah. For real. And hard to fix. Um, uh, but I guess to go back, man, like where do you kind of grow up? How do you kind of initially get into photography? Uh, I grew up in the in the south of the Netherlands and uh, with a photographer father. So how I got into photography was just growing up in our in our house, basically. <laughs> so I grew up in the, you know, still in the in the red light of the dark room in, the, in our attic that my dad had back in the day, and uh, and so it was just kind of the natural. You know, there were cameras around always. So it wasn't something that I really thought about. It was just kind of there. Was he shooting like professionally or just kind of it was like his hobby or passion or? It started off as his hobby. He actually bought his first camera uh, right before I was born to take photos of, you know, having a child. Yeah. And then it kind of got out of hand and he ended up being an artist and like having exhibits all over the world and, um, you know, doing it professionally as well. Wow, that's awesome. That seems like uh, really exciting to have a parent who's into the arts and stuff. So they're kind of supportive of your kind of creative de- endeavors your whole life, pretty much, it sounds like. Oh, yeah. And and his father was an art painter. So like this is like definitely a, a family business. You know, it's it was never frowned upon or it was always supported. Are you guys like sitting around the dinner table cr- critiquing each other's work? Like, <laughs> like. Yeah, back in the day, yeah, we did. And now it's more like appreciating each other's work, kind of, you know. No, it's exciting. And when you kind of first picked up the camera, what kind of stuff were you, were you shooting? What kind of stuff were you shooting when you were kind of growing up? Uh, I mean, everything. As a kid, you know, there's not, there, you don't really have like, a, or at least I didn't have any kind of like, oh, I'm a portrait photographer kid. You know, like that wasn't really how I operated. It was more about like, Oh, camera, click, 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 you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I would just walk with my dad, wherever he go on a photo walk or whatever, you know, a shoot or whatever. And so I just shot whatever. And then I, I kind of left it behind photography for a long time because I fell in love with music and I became a musician. And, um, and, and I only really got back into photography about six years ago. Um, and, and just for fun. And then, and then I had a project called one of many, uh, for which I traveled around the United States taking portraits of people like creative communities in different cities. And it like, similar to notice, it wasn't really all that thought out. It was just something that was fun for me to do. And then it, that kind of got out of hand and became like a sponsored project with like MailChimp and, and, and Squarespace sponsoring it. And then I started getting hired to do this similar kind of photography, which was environmental portraits of um, creative people. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah and then i segued out of music and into photography basically that's cool like with the music stuff what kind of music were you making were you like playing an instrument or what type of music were you doing i was playing an instrument but most of the things that i was doing was running record labels and producing albums so i i also had a band and that was kind of like similar it's actually kind of a funny parallel i 
when I started my label, my, my independent record label, I started to put out my band's first record, you know, and now I'm starting a publishing imprint and, and the first, not for publishing my book, but the first book is my book just yeah. to show the world, like, this is what we can do kind of. And so back then I started a record label for, for, for our record. I put that out. Then two guys in the band had solo records. I was like, oh, cool. I'll put those out too. And I had been working at Universal Music. So at a big label. So I had like the background. And then after those two records, like I did a compilation record and all these bands from my community started coming to me and I started producing them. And over the course of about maybe eight years, I, I uh, produced and released about 85 albums. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was like a really serious period of my life. Um, w- w- d- this is interesting because everything you hear about the music industry, it's like one of the hardest ind- industries to break through. Obviously, photography is hard to break through as well. I- is there anything you think you learned from like working in the music industry that's kind of helped your photography career, I guess? I, I think so. I think it's very transferable, but I think it's even it's just kind of general knowledge in terms of like, don't forget to help people, you know, like the more the, there's this uh, famous marketer from back in the day named Zig Ziglar. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've ever heard of Seth Godin, by chance. Yep, yep. So Zig Ziglar was kind of like a mentor to Seth Godin. Like, I'm not actually sure if they knew each other, but like, that's how he describes him because he would listen to his audiobooks over and over. And he had a, 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 a thing that he said, which was, um, uh, the way, and I'm, I may be butchering it, but the, the, the gist of it is, um, the way to get w- what you want is to help as many people as possible get what they want. So, um, I, I come from an educational family. Like my parents are both teachers. My sister a teacher. I used to be a teacher. So I love teaching. I love sharing knowledge. And that's what I do with my newsletter, which is called process. Mm-hmm. And so even with this book, I've been documenting the process of making this book from the very beginning, from before I knew it was going to be a book. And so sharing, uh, sharing that knowledge is something that I learned when I was working in music. Like the more you share knowledge, the more people are going to be following along with what you're making because they want to learn too. And I love, and it's not a thing that I do because that makes people pay attention. I do it because I love to share and I, I want to help. But it does have that as a bonus effect that people pay attention because you're sharing something interesting and from the heart rather than, you know, you like there's people who only and there's nothing wrong with this, but there's people on YouTube or whatever that, who only do gear reviews mm-hmm. because it works, right? Because it gets a lot of views and it's popular and you can do affiliate links, whatever. But, uh, but I intentionally, because I felt that was covered really well already, I stepped in the other direction of sharing process related things and like, you know, emotional related things, like the things that are barriers in our head that we can run into as photographers and all of that stuff. I basically learned the first time around working in music. Yeah. I've always been envious, you know, from outside looking into the music industry, like it seems like musicians more than any other art form are so willing to collaborate via whatever, like hop on an album together, do a song together, jam, whatever, do a show. But with photography, it's very like, insular thing like i know a lot of photographers very closed off against about their process and don't want to share like who they're working for and very different it seems like the musicians more than the other art form are are willing to collaborate you you think that's like accurate or i think that sounds about right i think um i think it's also because they kind of have to you know like it's like uh, similar with film. Like you can't make a movie on your own. You know, it, it, need, it needs like a huge team. Mm-hmm. And and photography, I think, is better when you're collaborating uh, in some sort of way. But it but it is something that is for most people kind of like quote unquote possible to do purely individually. Mm-hmm. I think it gets better if you involve more people uh, if it's if they're the right people. But I think that is a little bit of a thing. But I also see you know. F- for if you look at the YouTube community of photography and the podcast community, you see lots of collaboration and uh, lots of supporting uh, of each other and like comments underneath YouTube videos where they're like really engaging in a, a cool collaborative kind of way and like meeting up and like people go on photo walks. And I do think that it's actually, especially in, in the analog community, I think there's a lot of really fun, genuine uh, collaboration and friendship happening. I think 
if you go to the like super hardcore like like mega pro like commercial photography maybe less so because it's so cutthroat and yeah. it's a different story but i see a lot of really joyful collaboration and and just community in in especially the analog community no definitely i agree um and when you kind of made that transition from like music to pursuing more of photography, was it where you kind of burnt out on the music industry or what kind of made you kind of want to jump back into photography more? I was a little bit burnt out um, because it's it, like you said, it's a really tough industry and I'd been doing it for quite a long time. And also this is right around the time when streaming became like a serious thing that regular people were starting to do. And I was one of the first people in the United States to, get to have a beta account for um, Spotify. Oh, wow. And when I when I had that and used it for the first time, first couple of times, I was like, oh, shoot, this is going to change everything and not for the better. I mean, it is for the better for the consumer because we now have all music of all time, pretty much. It's at crazy. Our it's crazy. I don't think people, like, like it's so nuts. I still think about that sometimes. You literally have like every freaking song in your phone. It's yeah. Like, it is crazy if you grew up in the cd era i mean i i i'm just old enough to have tagged along for that and i remember saving up money to buy a cd yeah. and then that was the only cd i would listen to and then you'd the have like the book weeks. in your car like your your cd book like it would be like yep. a thick yeah one. <laughs> yeah um, the, the like binder yeah <laughs> and then sometimes you had friends who had like really thick binders and you'd be really jealous because they had so many albums. And then people started burning CDs, yep. you know, illegally, of course. But <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it was not the same thing. And I think it's also very different now in terms of how you enjoy music, therefore, because I now, I, you know, I'm just speaking for myself. When, when I listen to a new album that comes out now, and obviously I'm streaming it, I'm, I don't really have the patience to to listen to it over and over and dig every song, dig into every song. And so therefore, when I have a new release, sometimes I just kind of throw it away because it's not hitting me right away. Whereas before, if I bought a CD with yep. my you know newspaper route money, I had to think long and hard to make sure that I was buying one that I thought I was going to really like. And then it, when I did buy it, I really had to like give it m my whole attention because there was just no other option. And I remember buying... I remember buying a CD by a group called the Ghetto Boys. Oh yeah, and and they had um, I forget what this CD is called. St I think it's called Still, maybe, but the song Still is on there. And uh, I bought that CD, and I really didn't like. I, I bought it based on like a recommendation, and I really didn't like it. But then it was all you know. I didn't have much else to listen, so I listened to it anyway because there were a couple of songs that I was starting to dig. But then after a certain amount of time, I was really into it. <laughs> and that doesn't happen anymore. You know, like now, if I'm not like into it right away, then I just don't pretty much don't listen to it again. You know, and that's yeah. kind of a shame. All and our, I think our attention think, spans are shit now. Because it's I like, know. And that's why I love photo books so much, because similar to that, if you compare it to that, it, going through photos on Instagram, like scrolling through photos, like you barely stop long enough really look at it like you're just tap tap through tap tap through right most people at least myself included and if you have a photo book you can you can actually sit down and there's no notifications popping up in my photo book and like my photo book notice is everything about it is specifically designed to be calming mm -hmm. and and nurturing and so when you're when you're sitting down with it even the way that like i went through 36 types of fabric to find the right fabric for the cloth binding it's a hardcover book with a cloth binding and so it had to be the right color yellow because it's the same yellow that the daisies in vancouver are oh, wow. and it had to be like a certain texture because i needed it to feel a certain way and so everything about this book is like mindfully designed by dan rubin and myself to create an experience whereas if you look at the same photos on the internet it's just not that kind of thing you know and so we were really like very thoughtfully put that together, which I, I'm a big photo book fan. If I could turn, if I could point the camera down, which I can't really right now, but the whole floor is full of photo books. That's like my, like one vice that I can spend money on basically, you know, it's just a big fan because the way you really can take in the photo and you can see the textures and you can see the composition properly and all 
I see the Avedon book behind you. I have that same book too. Yeah, I got you know, Avedon. Like, yeah, yeah, good one. Yeah, I've been going, I've been telling everybody during the pandemic. I I mean, I've always been collecting, but the last year I've been collecting even more. Mm-hmm. I just been going on eBay, man. There's yeah. so many dude deals. Like I got I got that Karsh book for like five bucks. I got like uh, a bunch of other books for mad cheap because there'll be like libraries in like middle America just selling off a, like a whole lot of books and it's like good stuff yeah, on there for it's cheap. great. Yeah. I got really lucky because it's not that Avedon book, but I got a copy of the uh, I have that one too, but I have a copy of the uh in the American West, West, yeah, uh, that is first print and signed. Wow, <laughs> that I that I found online from like usually those are real like more than I could afford thousands, thousands of dollars usually. And, and I got it like for super good deal on eBay too from like some local shop that was just selling it, and I was like, hey, you guys, sh- sure about this? Because you, you, you know, know you got you know you got here, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they were like, no, no it's cool. So that's Me- really exciting. Any good, any good, like uh, recent photo book pickups? Anything you picked up recently that you really enjoy that you'd recommend to anybody? I picked up a few of Alex Soth's books that I didn't have yet, and he, he's a very thoughtful um, uh, bookmaker and also now YouTuber, which is kind of funny because yeah, he's of a different generation than your average YouTuber. So, it, but I really enjoy it. Um, what else did I recently get? I'm just looking behind me. Well, uh, my friend Craig Mod released. It's not officially a photo book but it's like a photo book with a lot of writing in it mm. um and it's called kisa by kisa okay or kisa by kisa i am not 100 sure but it, it's a japanese word because he craig mott lives in japan and his thing is that he goes on um really long like historic walks like we're talking like seven weeks long walks and in uh, japan there's this tradition of these kisas which are kind of like I guess you could call them a Japanese diner in a way. Yeah. And they have this particular dish called pizza toast, which is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> and, uh, and he, yeah, he made a book, a uh, very beautiful book about um, walking that historic route and going to all these different pieces. And I was fortunate enough to be able to participate in the book. Like I helped him kind of like photo edit and sequence a little bit. And he actually wrote uh, an essay for my book, Notice. Oh, wow. so it's like that's another example of like collaboration within the photo community. See, so, yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. That music, yeah, collaboration, you're, you're good at it, dude. Like I see your Instagram, you really have like a cool like community of people. And I think it's like it, it's important, man. And it's it's fun. It's like getting to talk yeah, with other I mean, photographers. In, in the end, that's what it's all about. Right. Like community. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm looking uh, behind me to see if there's one more book that I can point out that I recently picked up. All right. Um, let's see. I tell I tell everybody. But I just picked up this one. I got. Uh, it's got Chris Buck's new book called Gentleman's Club. Have you heard about Chris Buck's new book? It's Chris Buck. It? Chris Buck. Are you familiar familiar with his work? I don't think so. Yeah, he's a really great photographer. Um, but he did a whole book on the partners of exotic dancers. So he would oh. go to like strip clubs and he would photograph like the boyfriends or. Um, significant others of the exotic dancers and he did like all these interviews with them it was it was really interesting. that's an interesting topic well here's I, I picked up another one that i recently got um which is abendlieb lied mm-hmm. uh, which means evening song in german uh, by birte piontek and i'm not sure if i pronounced that right but this is it wow um and it's very beautiful um it's also very mellow in terms like it's very serene i don't know if you can see yeah it looks great yeah the printing looks yeah. really nice uh yeah and it and so uh this book um was uh this book was um published by no it's a really difficult word for me to pronounce nomic like g-n-o-m-i-c uh, which is a really cool independent publisher and uh this book was produced uh by um the same producer that we're working with and it's i think the same printer also that we're working with for uh for my book notice so this is another definitely a good recommendation this is a beautiful book abundantly by birte piontek all right i'll check those down i like this man we're i like this this is great man we're sharing some books people can go check this out this is good stuff um yeah. and i guess like when you kind of started shooting more photography like when you kind of left the music stuff like 
did you kind of have a goal in mind for the type of work you wanted to do? Like, were you kind of viewing your photography as your like, career? Like, what was kind of the next step for you, I guess? No, I, when I started it up again, I was just doing it as creative expression, really, you know, like something that I kind of feel I need to do. Uh, it's, a, it's just a way for me to experience the world, to mm-hmm. like take it in in a calmer way. It, it, it it's, it's kind of just like the thing that I do, you know? So I wasn't necessarily thinking about it as a career per se. I just was doing it because I needed to. And I got lucky that I worked on that project, one of many with the with the portraits of the creative people right around the time that marketing and, and ad agencies started changing up their game and going from models for campaigns to real people for campaigns. And so I got like my timing was very lucky because I was shooting exactly the kind of stuff that those agencies started wanting to use for ad campaigns. And so I, that's kind of like how the ball got rolling for me. And um, that's what I still do now. So, you know, environmental portraits or portraits of uh, interesting people. And what I got really lucky with is because I've shot so many interesting regular, quote unquote, regular people. Uh, I have this huge Rolodex of people that I can cast in, in commercial campaigns which is actually very difficult to do and usually an agency needs to hire like a separate uh casting agency for that like oh we need like a uh, a man in his 40s who works with his hands for yeah. this campaign okay well don't worry about it i got one you know i got i got six of everything because i have shot so many people already and that's it's so nice because that means i already have a trusting relationship with those folks we met on the street or we met wherever we might've met and we kept in touch and they liked the experience of shooting with me the first time. And so it's much easier for me to reach out to say like, Hey, like for example, last year before the pandemic, one of the last big campaigns that I shot was for Hanes, Mm -hmm. the uh, t-shirt and underwear company. And they wanted to do a campaign um, with uh, seven uh, interesting regular guys who were important in their community and doing cool stuff in their community. Well, shooting a boxer ad with regular guys is not that easy because not every regular guy feels comfortable True. in just boxers, right? For in like magazine ads or whatever. But because I had shot so many interesting people already, they were already comfortable with me. And I was able to explain kind of the vision and how, how it would be totally cool and fun. And we cast that in a matter of two days and they were the agency that was involved. They were worried that it was going to take weeks before they knew they were going to be working with me. So, so it's just like a really fun. Yeah. It's really fun to be able to kind of like turn that into uh, my job. No, that's awesome. And like, what advice would you give to people that are interested in kind of pursuing that like commercial work and working with agencies? Like, like how, how do you kind of get your foot in the door and what's kind of been your approach to getting on people's radar when you're trying to like uh, get that type of work, I guess. I think what's really, really important is to self-assign work and to self-assign work that you want to be doing, right? The kind of work that I do commercially is the kind of work that I do personally, which is uh, pretty unique. And I feel very lucky with that. But that is also in part because the stuff that I was putting out into the world was this stuff. Like if you want to be a, uh, let's say, a music photographer who, you know, like, let's say you want to be like Danny Clinch, right? Like a very... Uh, very legendary uh, music portraiture and live music photographer. Well, if you want to be that, then go shoot that stuff. Like start at, start low, start with small bands locally. Don't start putting out like your product photography that you're also doing, or don't put your nature photography out there unless that's what you want to do, yeah. right? So self-assigning and instead of waiting for some client to assign something to you is is definitely key. So if you want to be the, like a local journalist who do, like documents like a certain community for the New York Times in X years, then start documenting your community because you're right there. You know, like don't wait for the New York Times to call you to be like, hey, can you document your community? No, you can just do it right now. Start documenting your community and then you're going to get better and better and better. And the cream does rise to the top most of the time. Yeah, it's like use whatever resources are around you and document the stuff that's in front of you. And then slowly but surely you'll, you'll build your way up to help shooting bigger and bigger assignments. It's just kind of like a building block thing, it seems like. Yeah. And, you know, a little bit of luck helps as well. <laughs> yeah. But there's like there's nothing that makes uh, luck happen more easily than go work also, you know. 
Yeah, definitely. I know you mentioned I was going to pull it up. Your project, one of many. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, really great stuff. Like, how are you kind of finding all these different creatives? What was kind of the process of like um, kind of collaborating with all these different people? Um, well, I would before I would go to each city, I would usually already know one or two people and I would reach out to them and be like, hey, I'm doing this project. Um, who should I talk to? Who should I talk to in your city? Mm -hmm. And then they would have a couple, they would have like five people for me to check out. And then I would research them, re reach out to the ones that I thought would be good. And, um, you know, they would then usually say, yeah, I'd love to be a part of it. Also, you should talk to my friend, Joe, whatever, you know? And so it just kind of organically happened. And so I would say about two thirds of the people. So I did about, about 50 different people per city and it's 12 cities. Wow. Um, so about two thirds of the people I would have set up before I would get there. And then the rest, I, I would leave time for like serendipity. Like if, if I would leave one place and someone would be like, Hey, by the way, just down the street, there's this amazing sculptor or, or chef. Let me introduce you. Then there would be time for that too still. Um, and yeah, so about two thirds was set up beforehand. And one third was like in the moment people that I would like the girl that you see here on the left. Um, that was someone that I, that I just met right there in the coffee shop oh, wow. and we started chatting and, and she um, I forget right now what she, I think she was a student of fashion or something. I forget right now because it's been so many people, but um, I was like, Oh, great. Well, that fits my project. Would you mind if I take your portrait? You know? And so that's just kind of would happen sometimes as well. And I would imagine like the more you start doing this and you're, you're sharing the work, like I would imagine people, it kind of builds momentum, right? Like people like, yeah. Hey, Hey, talk to my friend or whatever. Cause they, they know you're doing it. So this kind of feel like the momentum is kind of builds the longer you do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And is this something you're kind of continually working on or is this project kind of done for you? No, this project, um, I did 12 cities and that, that was the, what I set out to do at the time. So this is from, um, to that i want to say 2013 14 or maybe 14 15 i forget uh yeah so this is like this is my first proper photography project that i did and what's like your approach to portraiture like do you do you have a goal in mind when you kind of go into these portrait sessions or is it more kind of an organic kind of collaboration with the subject or how do you kind of approach portrait shoots well, it depends on what it's for. Like in this case, if it's for one of many or, or one of my personal projects, then it's pure instinct and, and collaboration and, and just kind of what, whatever it feels like, right? But if it's for a client, then there's a, there's a specific purpose, right? So if it's for, um, for an ad, let's say for one of those Hanes ads, well, I'm, I'm telling the story of the, of the client, right? I'm telling the story, not only of the person that is modeling in this case, because it's their story was important too. We picked real people with interesting stories, but I'm also trying to highlight, you know, the underwear in this case or, yeah. or whatever it might be. And so it, every job is different. And, and whether it's personal projects or, or client project, I just trying to do my best to kind of capture um, whatever the story is that I, that we need to tell in the best and more like most like, comfortable way possible oh that's great and another thing you do you do a lot of stuff man mad respect dude you're a hustler i love it <laughs> uh you do you do an interview series um called the observers i was just kind of curious like how that kind of started and what, what your kind of goal with that was because you got to interview some amazing people man i think like elliot Irwitt and anybody listening you have a video i texted you like a year or two ago on instagram you got to go to bruce davidson's house and he gave you a tour of his dark room which was insane but yeah how did the kind of observers thing kind of start for you the observers is a project that i started with my friend paul jun who's also a great photographer he lives in brooklyn and we were uh, studio mates for a long time well like two different floors in the same building and um you know, both again, photo book lovers, like the observers is also about photo books. A lot of things that I do are about books. And so the observers is um, specifically talking to photographers that we admire about the photo books that inspire them, because we, we got to a point where we're like, well, you know, we have a fair amount of photo books, but 
there's not really much of a resource out there to find good photo books, right? Like occasionally you'll see like an end of the year list, like best photo books of 2020 or whatever. Yeah. But there's not much of uh, when it comes to recommendations, like you do actually have for novels, like you can find recommendations for novels or movies, you know, everywhere, but not so much for photo books. And so we thought, well, how can we solve that issue? How can we help more people find good photo books? Uh, you know, well, we should recommend photo books. Well, what would be the most meaningful recommendation that we can give? Well, it wouldn't be my recommendation. You know, it would be Elliot Irwitt's recommendation. It would be Bruce Davidson's recommendation. It would be Jack Davidson's record. Like all these, all these photographers whose work we really love, we're essentially asking them the question, Hey, you inspire us. Who inspires you? Right. And so if Elliot Irwitt tells me five photo books that have inspired him, I'm going to want to check them out much more than if, if I recommended it myself to, to someone, right. That's like Elliot Irwin has a whole like storied career and he has his own photo books that are incredible. And so I know he has, you know, he's read a lot of books and he's been in the business for a long time and I love how he sees things. And so I want to know what he recommend I get. So that's kind of how that project started. No, it's great. And the thing I realized even from doing my own podcast is that we all kind of live in our own little bubble of like the photographer we, we know and stuff. And just everybody has their own circle of photographers that inspire them. And there's just so many people out there. So it's like it's even for myself getting to talk to people with like the photographers that inspire them. It's just kind of opened my mind to all these different like photographers and photo books and everything. So I would imagine getting to talk to so many people and hear all these different books is pretty inspiring. It is for sure. And then that's just kind of what we try to do with that project to kind of like pass that inspiration around, you know? Yeah. And you, I was looking at you, you got to speak with Ricky Powell, uh, rest in I peace. He passed away a couple months ago. Legendary dude, amazing photographer. Um, yeah. How's it getting to kind of collaborate with him, kind of talking to him, I guess? Well, it was definitely the craziest interview I've ever done <laughs> because he was a real character and, and I didn't, I didn't really know the extent to which he was a character until I met him in person. Um, he would say some wild stuff, you know, <laughs> like we were sitting at this um, cafe and it was kind of the middle of the day. So there weren't really that many people there, but there were like two or three. He was the regular there. It was kind of like a pretty chic cafe, some kind of restaurant bistro, bistro let's call it a bistro mm -hmm. and uh the people that worked there knew him because he I, I think that was his neighborhood in the west village and he would go there a lot i think and so there were some people that i think might have been tourists that were sitting kind of close to us and i was interviewing him when i was recording it um just audio yeah. and um and he's you know ricky was kind of a loud talker so people would definitely like picking up some of the things that he was saying and some of the things he was saying were are just kind of insane um and very funny if you knew if you knew him but if you didn't know who he was then it might have sounded like some real wild stuff you know yeah. and so it was i definitely there were definitely moments during that interview where i was a little bit worried <laughs> that the people next to us were going to call the police or something uh, but they didn't they just gave us some dirty looks here and there but yeah he was uh certainly a unique character and you know he was around for the early days of hip hop, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's my favorite genre of music. Yeah. So that was really cool to get to hear some of those stories. No, it was great. I was glad to see you had them on the, on, up on your site. It was great. Um, you know, one thing I was interested in talking to you about being you, you, you've lived in a lot of different cities and kind of have an interesting perspective. I think like a lot of photographers think they need to like move to New York city or move to LA to be a photographer. Like, well, what's your opinion? Do you think you need to live in these big hubs to start your career or like have a successful career in photography these days, or can you kind of live wherever you think? Well, I think there's more and more an interest to, uh, if you're interested in photojournalism, I think newspapers and magazines are more and more interested in hiring people that are local to where the story is, Yeah, uh, which I think is good because they would know the city, the culture, the community better than rather than a New York photographer flying out there for the most part. Um, so I don't think that it's necessary to live in New York to start. Well, certainly not now, but let's pretend that the pandemic isn't happening, right? Let's, let's take that out of the equation. Being in New York, is better in terms of being able to run into people 
whether it's like fellow photographers on the street or, you know, the ability to get, if you get a meeting with an editor, you don't have to fly there. You can just go by. Right. So that is really nice, but I don't think it is necessary. Um, you know, there's, there were times where I wasn't in New York for, you know, more than let's say like uh, two months in a year because I was traveling so much, but because New York is such a busy city, no one really noticed, you know, so I was still like living in New York, even though I was gone most of the time. And so it, it, you don't necessarily have to be there, but it is oftentimes really helpful to go there. But now, you know, who knows what, what happens after all this hopefully is over and travel gets easier again. Cause I think now we've gotten much more used to having zooms and, mm -hmm. you know, if I were to do a portfolio review uh, you know, I, I do these mentor sessions where um, people can like buy a mentor session with me and we either can do a portfolio review or I coach them for one of their projects, stuff like that. And before that, I really hadn't thought much about doing it online because it felt weird. But now everybody's gotten so good at, at, at using something like Zoom and you can have a screen share. And, and instead of like, you know, you can't hold pictures up to the screen and expect me to, you know, but we can do a screen share. Yeah. And so nowadays I think it's, it has democratized that a bit. I think it's easier now to not live in those. I think in the nineties, you had to live in New York. I think yep. now, not necessarily, you might yeah. have to visit a few times, but um, that's fine. Cause it's a cool place to visit. Yeah, it's definitely true. Yeah. yeah if the work's good, people will find you. Um, yeah. Cause it's something I've been thinking about a lot. And I was talking with my friend, a fellow photographer. Cause like, I'm like, are people going to meet and do portfolio reviews in person ever again? Because like, for me, that's how I got like a lot of my first jobs is kind of pounding that pavement, going to New York or going to whatever city to meet with agencies and editors. And uh, yeah, yeah. It's, I've definitely within the last year, just trying to figure out how to navigate and still market your business because it's like, it's harder to do direct mail because everyone's working from home. So it's like mm -hmm. harder to like this hit up random people and be like, Hey, what's your home address? I want to send you yeah. a promo. You can't really do that. It's kind of tough. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's just been, been kind of, I don't know, how have you been kind of navigating marketing your business during this weird time, I guess, if you kind of had to switch up how I you mean, I, I, I've had like a pretty challenging year because my business has basically stopped, you know, like, yep. first of all, I was in Canada where I'm not allowed to work for, you know, and there was no one was hiring in the fi first five months of, of, uh, of, um, COVID anyway, right? Like all the budgets were shut down and like everything stopped, all travel stopped. And so during that period, I really didn't work much at all. I had a few things that I had already in the works that I was able to still edit during that time. But yeah. uh, I, I, I got really lucky because I shot a few big jobs right before COVID. And so I was still in the process of working those projects, mm -hmm. just post shoot. Um, but then there was like a really long period where I didn't get to work at all. And that's also how this book came about because again, I needed to, I needed an anchor. I needed something to hold on to because I wasn't getting jobs. I wasn't able to go anywhere. All the things were weird. And so I, I started these daily walks and that became my like anchor to hold on to. And then, uh, you know, it thankfully, even though it wasn't the plan, it actually turned into a project and yeah. then it turned into a book. And so now I get to sell this book to to people and I'm super proud of it. And, and it is kind of a lemonade from the lemon, if you will, you know? Yeah, it's definitely you're being proactive and using that yeah, downtime to your advantage to work on these different projects. Because, I mean, as you know, like this creative career path, be it like you're in music and now you're in photography. It's a very like it's ups and downs. You have times where it's great and times where it's bad. Like, have you ever kind of doubted yourself in this creative career path? And how do you kind of keep the train on the tracks when those times are when you're hitting those lulls sometimes because they they come they definitely come i think it's you know if you work for yourself whether as a, whether it's as a photographer or a plumber i don't maybe i i guess plumbers probably have less lulls because that's very kind of it's a commodity right everybody needs help with that a lot of time but yeah if you're a small business owner of whatever kind yeah it comes with the territory you know mm -hmm. it, it is not as stable as working at a job job. And it is, uh, it does, it gives you on the good side of things. It gives you uh, more freedom to uh, plan your calendar mm -hmm. on the not so great side. It, it doesn't give you the stability that, that a full-time job gives you. So yeah, everybody hits a lull and everybody hits a, a point where they're like, huh, 
oh, is this sustainable? Like, oh, I'm about, let's say, let's say that I'm about to have a baby, which I'm not, but let's say I, I was like, all of a sudden, that's a different story, right? Like, maybe that means, uh, oh, well, I can't hit a lull while, I, while I'm trying to raise a child, right? I need to like come up with something. So that's how I think some people end up being photo editors or leave the business altogether because it is hard. Yeah, definitely. But and on the other side, it's like whatever you put into it, like you can get that in return, you know, like if you put in the hard work and you're building that portfolio, I know myself the times where I did take the time to shoot a project and put, put personal work out there. It, it, it takes time and patience, but in, in the end, it, it, a lot of times it, it, there's a positive finish at the end, you know? Yeah. And I think it is definitely the kind of, even if it's maybe if it, maybe it's not necessarily the on level of success, but on level of, craft mm -hmm. getting better at it yeah it is certainly the what you put in is what you get out yeah that Definitely. is a very pure it's a very pure craft it's complex it's complicated you're never done learning there's always stuff that you won't know or that is different or that you're not used to and so it's kind of a continuous learning program for the rest of your life and even at the end of it you're not you're gonna know like five percent of yeah. everything you know <laughs> and so it's definitely in terms of like you get out what you put in in terms of the craft, I think that's definitely true. In terms of financial success, there's also luck involved. There's also, you know, where do you, where do you? Live, what are you working on? Like with methodical worker on like, like topics that are not necessarily commercial or people aren't necessarily interested in them right in this moment. Maybe, maybe it'll be very tough. You know, but that's also possible then that 30 years down the line, you've done this like amazing documentary on uh, the Uyghur community. And all of a sudden that's like a huge story in the world. Right. And yeah. now yep. people want that, that kind of photography. So it's, you know, it is not a sure shot, but it sure is fun when it's working. <laughs> no, definitely, man. Photography at the end of the day, it's just, if you enjoy it, let's keep doing it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one project on your site that I was interested in talking to you about, um, it was called a series called what we think we know about love. Um, really interesting photo series. I was kind of curious what that pro project was all about for you. Uh, that was a collaboration, I think 2018, maybe um, with uh, my friend, Mickey Brammer, who is a photographer, but also a writer. And in this, with this project, she was the writer. Uh, and uh, we were both uh, romantics who were very curious to hear people's stories about love. And so what we did is we ended up um, interviewing a variety of people like, you know, freshly divorced or never been in love or in an open marriage or a 35 year old woman in New York having a challenging time dating or, you know, like different kinds of people. And we interviewed them uh, about their life and how, you know, how they thought about love and what, um, challenges they face and and all that kind of stuff and so and then i took the portraits for that series as well and then Mick, mickey did the writing and we would have conversations together with mickey kind of taking the lead and uh, and she would write it into a story and i would do the portraits and how are you kind of finding these people and because it, it seems like uh I don't know, kind of tough thing. Some people are not as open to talk about these type of things, but like, how did you kind of find your subjects? I guess some of them were people that we knew, um, but some of them we actually found on Tinder. So okay. what we did is we, we, um, uh, neither one of us was, uh, was single at the time, but we set up a special Tinder profile. Well, both of us did one as a woman and one as a man, uh, we're on the profile. We, we, did, we said like, Hey, we're, we're here to see if we can find some people to talk to about love and take their portrait. And this is a project, blah, blah, blah. blah. And so uh, people, um, you know, if, if we matched with someone, then we would say like, Hey, I don't know if you saw the profile because not everybody reads those things, right. It could be that they just looked at the photo, yeah. uh, but this is the project that we're working on. And would you be interested? And uh, so, yeah, so I think about half or maybe even more than half are came that came from, from Tinder. That's great. And it's working with a writer or something you kind of enjoy that kind of collaboration, what they kind of bring to it. Do you feel like it kind of helps inform your photographs at all? Yeah. For a project like this, for sure. Like I think, um, you know, Mickey is a, is a really fantastic writer and that's like such a, a skill that I so admire. Like it's, you know, I'm always continuously trying to become a better writer through doing my newsletter. And, um, 
to work with someone who's like a pro at that kind of stuff is really fun because you, you know hopefully you kind of like through osmosis pick up some of like their technique and stuff like that no that's great and i guess to wrap up was he like i mean you've done a lot with your photography already but like what what's next for you man obviously you got the book coming out and it's it people can, can they buy it directly through your website or where can they find the book they can find it on newstyle.co, which is the, the publishing imprint that Dan and I started, newstyle.co, C-O. And um, that's where we have the pre-order currently going. And the pre-order runs until April 27th. So that's next, we're, while we're recording it right now, that's like eight days from now, uh, April 27th. And um, if anyone is interested in buying it, you can go to the website, check out uh, some of the photos, the story behind the project, the, all the like details and and before um, April 27, like by the time through the whole pre-order campaign, the book is 10 uh, euros off. And also it comes with a free bonus uh, zine. We made a zine that documents the whole process of making the book because again, like we love to teach. And so this, this is kind of like, hey, this is how you make a book or this is how we made our book. Mm -hmm. it, it breaks the whole thing down. And that's a zine that will only come with the book for free and only during the pre-order campaign. So after April 27th, if there's any books left, cause they're going really fast right now, that zine will never be made again. But during the pre-order campaign, everybody that pre-orders the book gets that zine as a free bonus. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's exciting. And I guess for any other uh, kind of goals for your work moving forward, any kind of projects or things you're hoping to work on in, in the future. I got a few projects that I'm brewing on here in Amsterdam where I am now. And, um, Mostly I just kind of like reestablishing myself as a photographer because my entire photo career was in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I mean, traveling also, of course, but like being based in New York City and now I'm in Amsterdam. And so I kind of have to uh, kind of reestablish myself because I've never worked here uh, before. And it's like got to meet the people and like get going with that stuff. And so one thing I'm working on is that. And the other thing is this book. I mean, that's really my main project right now, getting the word out about the book. We're super proud of it. We're really excited for it to live in the world. And the first print is going super well. We already sold out of a bunch of the different versions of the book. Like we have a special edition and oh, a wow. print and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so there's a couple hundred left and they might be gone by the end of the pre-order, which would be awesome. Like an awesome start for our uh, publishing company. Heck yeah. That's exciting, man. Well, Wesley, dude, I'm glad we connected and made this happen, dude. I really appreciate your work and everything you do. Like, definitely go check out wesley's website i'll link it in here in the book and stuff definitely go pick that up but uh thanks so much man yeah thank you so there you have it that was the wesley verhuva interview uh just want to thank wesley so much for taking the time to come on the podcast um if you're interested in picking up a copy of uh, wesley's new book titled notice um definitely go check that out you can go to his instagram at wesley um click the link in his bio and you can uh pick up a copy of the book i think the pre-order ends in about eight days um so definitely go uh check that out if you're interested i'll put the link in the descriptions um so you can click that and as always i'll be having weekly podcasts every week on apple podcasts spotify as well as the photo banter youtube page if you're interested in the video version you can go to our youtube and as always thanks so much for listening and take care